Okay, today is 27th of July, 2010. Now we continue the Majima Nikaya. We come to Sutta number 22. Alagadu Pama Sutta. The simile of the snake. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living <coughs> at Savati in Jeta's Grove, another Pindika Spark. Now on that occasion, a pernicious view had arisen in a monk named Arita, formerly of the vulture killers. Thus, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things <coughs> call obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages <coughs> in them. Several monks, having heard about this, went to the monk Arita and asked him, Friend, <coughs> Friend Arita, is it true that such a pernicious view has arisen in you? Exactly so, friends. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by, by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. Then these monks, desiring to detach him from that pernicious view, pressed and questioned and cross-questioned him thus, Friend Arita, do not say so. Do not misrepresent the Blessed One. It is not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. The Blessed One would not speak thus. For in many discourses, the Blessed One has stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. The Blessed One has stated how sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and much despair, and how great is the danger in them. With the simile of the skeleton, with the simile of the piece of meat, with the simile of the grass torch, with the simile of the pit of coals, with the simile of the dream, with the simile of the borrowed goods, with the simile of the tree laden with fruit, with the simile of the slaughterhouse, with the simile of the sword stake, with the simile of the snake's head. The Blessed One has stated how sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and much despair, and how great is the danger in them. Yet although pressed and questioned and cross-questioned by them in this way, the monk Arita, formerly of the vulture killers, still obstinately adhered to that pernicious view and continued to insist upon it. I'll stop here for a moment. So this monk Arita is saying that uh, obstructions uh, are, are not really obstructions. La. So these uh, obstructions, uh, uh, you see here, when the monks uh, start to question him and all that, uh, they talk about sensual pleasures. So uh, obstructions here refers to sensual pleasures. Uh, because during the Buddha's time, there were many ascetics uh, who were naked. Uh, among ascetics as well as non-ascetics. Uh, and so sometimes, uh, uh, seeing naked bodies, uh, they were... Um, uh, stirred and then they engage in this uh, sensual pleasures. La. And the Buddha says uh, that is wrong. La. And this uh, simile of the skeleton, piece of meat, etc., actually uh, uh, a more detailed uh, description uh, is given in the Majima Nikaya Sutta 54, la. Potalia Sutta. Uh, 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 so later we will come to that. Uh, so, uh, okay, to continue. Uh, since the monks were unable to detach him from that pernicious view, they went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told him all that had, all that had occurred, adding, Venerable Sir, since we could not detach the monk Arita, formerly of the vulture killers, from this pernicious view, we have reported this matter to the Blessed One. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain monk thus, Come monk, tell the monk Arita, formerly of the vulture killers, in my name that the teacher calls him. Yes, venerable sir, he replied. And he went to the monk Arita and told him, The teacher calls you friend Arita. Yes, friend, he replied. And he went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, sat down at one side. 
the Blessed One then asked him, Harita, is it true that the following pernicious view has arisen in you? As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. Exactly so, Venerable Sir. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. And the Buddha said, Misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, in many discourses have I not stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. I have stated how sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and much despair, and how great is the danger in them. With the simile of the skeleton, with the simile of the piece of meat, with the simile of the grass torch, with the simile of the pit of coals, with the simile of the dream, with the simile of the borrowed goods, with the simile of the tree laden with fruit, with the simile of the slaughterhouse, with the simile of the sword stake, with the simile of the snake's head. I have stated how sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and much despair, and how great is the danger in them. But you, misguided man, have misrepresented us by your wrong grasp and injured yourself and stored up much demerit. For this will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So this silly fellow, huh, even in front of the Buddha, he says uh, what the Buddha calls obstructions are not obstructions. Uh, and then the Buddha continued. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, what do you think? Has this monk Arita, formerly of the vulture killers, kindled even a spark of wisdom in this Dhamma Vinaya? How could he, Venerable Sir? No, Venerable Sir. When this was said, the monk Arita, formerly of the vulture killers, sat silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum, and without response. Then knowing this, the Blessed One told him, Misguided man, you will be recognized by your own pernicious view. I shall question the monks on this matter. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, do you understand the Dhamma taught by me as this monk Arita, formerly of the vulture killers? Thus, when he misrepresents us by his wrong grasp and injures himself and stores up much demerit. No, Venerable Sir, for in many discourses the Blessed One has stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. The Blessed One has stated how sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and much despair, and how great is the danger in them with the simile of the skeleton, with the simile of the snake's head, etc. The Blessed One has stated how great is the danger in them. Good monks, it is good that you understand the Dhamma taught by me thus. For in many discourses I have stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. I have stated how sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and much despair, and how great is the danger in them. With the simile of the skeleton, with the simile of the snake's head, uh, etc. I have stated how great is the danger in them. But this monk Arita, formerly of the vulture killers, misrepresents us by his wrong grasp and injures himself and stores up much demerit, for this will lead to this misguided man's harm and suffering for a long time. Monks, that one can engage in sensual pleasures without sensual desires, without perceptions of sensual desire, without thoughts of sensual desire, that is impossible. I'll stop here for a moment. So this last part is very important. The Buddha is saying uh, that one can engage in sensual pleasures uh, without sensual desires, without perceptions of sensual desire, without thoughts of sensual desire. That is impossible. In some other sutta, I think Majjhima Nikaya 43, the Buddha says uh, that when uh, we enjoy sensual pleasures, uh, there is this tendency uh, to crave for it. Uh, so it is impossible uh, to engage in sensual pleasures uh, without the desire arising. Uh. And this contradicts uh, some of the later books, uh, for example, in the 
uh, secret school the uh, uh, later part of Buddhism they thought about this uh, tantric Buddhism tantric Buddhism comes from tantra uh, tan, uh, tantra yoga uh, where uh, they say that the, the people on the spiritual path uh, can engage in sex and all these things uh, and, and it can even help you to attain enlightenment uh, it's completely rubbish uh, and even like the Mahayana Sutras like this Vimalakirti Sutra where he says uh, the uh, Bodhisattva Manjushri uh, can uh, be like a lay person uh, uh, do all the uh, uh, enjoy all the worldly pleasures uh, and still have great attainment and great wisdom. Uh, this contradicts, for example, the Magandya Sutta, where the Buddha says uh, that uh, you cannot find a king or a king's minister enjoying sensual pleasures uh, and yet able to practice the spiritual path uh, like a renunciant and attain the jhanas and the uh, paths and fruits and all that uh, are in stages. Uh. So, why this is so? Because uh, if you look into the uh, 12 links of dependent origination, you will find that uh, craving and attachment uh, brings about the ego. Uh, when you have craving and attachment, uh, the I am arises, uh, the ego arises, I am enjoying. Uh, so uh, the spiritual path uh, is to eliminate our ego. So to eliminate the ego, uh, you have to eliminate the craving, the desire. Uh, so it is impossible to engage in sensual pleasures uh, without sensual desires, uh, directly contradicting uh, this uh, later Buddhist teaching uh, in the, uh, this uh, secret school, uh, esoteric Buddhism. Here, monks, some misguided men learn the Dhamma, discourses, stanzas, expositions, verses, exclamations, sayings, birth stories, marvels, and answers to questions. But having learned the Dhamma, they do not examine the meaning of those teachings with wisdom. Not examining the meaning of those teachings with wisdom, they do not gain a reflective acceptance of them. Instead, they learn the Dhamma only for the sake of criticizing others and for winning in debates, and they do not experience the good for the sake of which they learn the Dhamma. Those teachings, being wrongly grasped by them, conduce to their harm and suffering for a long time. Suppose a man needing a snake, seek, seeking a snake, wandering in search of a snake, saw a large snake and grasped its coils or its tail. It would turn back on him and bite his hand or his arm or one of his limbs. And because of that, he would come to death or deadly suffering. Why is that? Because of his wrong grasp of the snake. So too, here some misguided men learn the Dhamma. Uh, and those teachings, being wrongly grasped by them, conduce to the harm and suffering for a long time. Mm, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha says, uh, uh, these uh, misguided men, uh, they learn the Dhamma, but they do not examine the meaning of the teachings uh, with wisdom. And not examining the meaning of the teachings with wisdom, uh, do not, they do not gain a reflective acceptance of them. Uh, they only learn uh, for debating uh, or criticizing others. Uh. Even nowadays, uh, we find uh, some of our so-called uh, Buddhist devotees are like that. They criticize others, but they themselves don't keep the precepts and all that. So, you see here, something interesting, the Buddha says that if you examine the meaning of the teachings with wisdom, then you can gain a reflective, reflective acceptance of them. This uh, examining the, the meaning of the suttas and, and gaining a reflective acceptance uh, means uh, uh, understanding the Dhamma and understanding the Dhamma you get right view and when you get right view uh, you have entered the stream uh, it, the first path uh. so just by a reflective acceptance of the Buddha's teachings uh, you get right view and enter the stream uh. but then uh, after you enter the stream uh, you still have to work uh. you have to st study some more uh, Dhamma and uh, keep the sila uh, and 
and slowly uh, when you understand on a deeper level uh, then the uh, uh, three factors fall away uh, and you become a sotapanna uh, uh. so this first part uh, is just uh, uh, understanding the Dhamma and getting a reflective gaining a reflective acceptance of them uh, mm. Here monks, some clansmen learn the Dhamma, discourses, stanzas, expositions, etc. And having learned the Dhamma, they examine the meaning of those teachings with wisdom. Examining the meaning of those teachings with wisdom, they gain a reflective acceptance of them. They do not learn the Dhamma for the sake of criticizing others and for winning in debates. And they experience the good for the sake of which they learn the Dhamma. Those teachings being rightly grasped by them, conduce to the welfare and happiness for a long time. Suppose a man needing a snake, seeking a snake, wandering in search of a snake, saw a large snake and caught it rightly with a cleft stick, and having done so, grasped it rightly by the neck. Then although the snake might wrap its claws round his hand, or his arm, or his limbs, still he would not come to death or deadly suffering because of that. Why is that? because of his right grasp of the snake. So too, here some clansmen learn the Dhamma, and those teachings being rightly grasped by them conduce to their welfare and happiness for a long time. Therefore, monks, when you understand the meaning of my statements, remember it accordingly. And when you do not understand the meaning of my statements, then ask either me about it or those monks who are wise. Mm, stop here for a moment. Uh, so here, uh, um, a wise person uh, uh, will learn the Dhamma to understand the meaning of the Dhamma. Uh, then when you can understand it, uh, you accept it. Uh, that is uh, learning the Dhamma for the right purpose. Uh. Also the Buddha says here, uh, when you understand the meaning of the suttas, the Buddha statements are uh, are in the discourses, uh, the suttas of the Buddha. And the Buddha says, uh, remember it accordingly la, to what he says. La. But if you do not remember, if you don't understand, uh, then we should ask somebody who understands. La. And that's why when we study the Dhamma, two things are important, Dhamma Savana and Dhamma Sakacha. Dhamma Savana is le uh, hearing the Dhamma. La. Dhamma Sakacha is discussion of the Dhamma, uh, discussion uh, uh, with um, Dhamma friends uh, who understand the Dhamma and then uh, uh, whatever questions you have uh, can be answered. Monks, I shall show you how the Dhamma is similar to a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the monks replied. The Blessed One said this, Monks, suppose a man in the course of a journey saw a great expanse of water whose near shore was dangerous and fearful and whose further shore was safe and free from fear, but there was no ferry boat or bridge going to the far shore. Then he thought, there is this great expanse of water whose near shore is dangerous and fearful and whose further shore is safe and free from fear. But there is no ferry boat or bridge going to the far shore. Suppose I collect grass, twigs, branches and leaves and bind them together into a raft and supported by the raft and making, my, and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the far shore. And then the man collected grass, twigs, branches and leaves and bound them together into a raft. And supported by the raft and making an effort with his hands and feet, he got safely to the far shore. Then when he had got across and had arrived at the far shore, he might think thus, This raft has been very helpful to me since supported by it and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the far shore. Suppose I were to hoist it on my head or load it on my shoulder and then go wherever I want. Now monks, what do you think? By doing so, would that man be doing what should be done with that raft? No, Venerable Sir. By doing what would that man be doing uh, what should be done with that raft? Here, monks, where that man had got, had got across and had arrived at the far shore, he might think thus, this raft has been very helpful to me 
since supported by it and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the far shore. Suppose I were to haul it onto the dry land and set it adrift in the water, or set it adrift in the water, and then go wherever I want. Now, monks, it is by so doing that that man would be doing what should be done with that raft. So I have shown you how the Dhamma is similar to a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. Monks, when you know the Dhamma to be similar to a raft, you should abandon even good states, how much more so bad states. Let's stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is saying that the Dhamma is for the purpose of crossing over to the other shore. Uh, the other shore is Nibbana. No? This shore, uh, which is dangerous and fearful, uh, is Sangsara, the round of rebirths. Uh, so the Buddha is saying uh, that uh, that is the only purpose of the Dhamma, uh, to bring us across to Nibbana. Uh, and then lastly, the Buddha says uh, that the Dhamma is similar to, to a raft. Uh, and uh, you should abandon even good states, how much more so bad states. Uh, bad states are, are of course uh, evil karma, uh, doing evil uh, to the body, speech and mind. Good states uh, may be like um, doing charity and all that. Uh, if a person is practicing the spiritual path, uh, then it's uh, not important to do uh, charity and other uh, good deeds, uh, no, the point is to get to the other shore and eliminate the ego, uh, the self. Uh. And also it can mean uh, that uh, abandon attachment uh, to good states. Uh. Uh, even good states, uh, we should not attach to it. Uh. No. Just like the raft, the raft is something useful, uh, but after it has helped you to go across to the other shore, uh, you don't carry it on your head. Uh. Uh, and go around, uh, you just leave it down. So in the same way, uh, when we practice a spiritual path, uh, we uh, do certain practices uh, to get us across, uh, for example, even like uh, uh, ascetic practices and all that. Uh, but uh, uh, after it has helped us, uh, then the Buddha says, uh, don't attach to it, uh, don't uh, put it on your head. Uh, according to the commentary, says that uh, uh, what the Buddha means uh, is not even to attach to um, uh, samatha vipassana, la, serenity and insight. And uh, they quote, uh, 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 not attaching to serenity, uh, is not attaching to the jhanas. La. They quote the Sutta Majjhima Nikaya 66. La. And not attaching to insight, uh, they quote Majjhima Nikaya Sutta 38. La, uh, now the Buddha continues, Monks, there are these six standpoints for views. What are the six? Here, monks, an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, regards mat uh, material form or body thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. He regards feeling thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. He regards perceptions thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. He regards volition thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. He regards what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, sought, mentally pondered thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And this standpoint for views, namely, this is self, this the world, after death I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. This too he regards thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Monks, a well-taught noble disciple who has regard for noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in the Dhamma, who has regard for true men and is skilled and disciplined in the Dhamma, regards material form thus, this is not mine, this is not this I am not, this is not myself. It regards feeling, perception, volition, consciousness. Consciousness here refers to the seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, sought, mentally pondered. Uh, uh, as this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Uh, and this standpoint for views, namely this is self, this is the world. 
After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. This too he regards thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is my. This is not myself. Since he regards them thus, he is not agitated about what is non-existent. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha is talking about six ten points for views. Um, the first five uh, are the five aggregates: la, body, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. And the sixth one is views. Uh, uh, if you attach to these uh, six things, uh, as this is mine, this I am, this is myself, uh, then you will have uh, uh, views. La. Mm. Uh, but a noble disciple uh, sees them rightly uh, and he is not uh, agitated about what is non existent um, because uh, the five aggregates uh, uh, is not the self, uh, no self. Uh, so uh, that's why he says uh, it's non existent. Uh, mm. When this was said, a certain monk asked the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, can there be agitation about what is non-existent externally? There can be, monk, the Blessed One said. Here, monk, someone thinks thus, Alas, I had it. Alas, I have it no longer. Alas, may I have it. Alas, I do not get it. Then he sorrows, grieves and laments. He, he weeps, beating his breast and becomes distraught. That is how there is agitation about what is non-existent externally. Venerable Sir, can there be no agitation about what is non-existent externally? There can be, Monk, the Blessed Ones said. Here, Monk, someone does not think, Alas, I had it. Alas, I have it no longer. Alas, may I have it. Alas, I do not get it. Then he does not sorrow, grieve and lament. He does not weep, beating his breast and become distraught. That is how there is no agitation about what is non-existent externally. Remember, sir, can there be agitation about what is non-existent internally? There can be, monk, the Blessed One said. Here, monk, someone has the view, this is self, this is the world. After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. He hears the Tathagata or a disciple of the Tathagata teaching the Dhamma for the elimination of all standpoints, decisions, obsessions, adherences and underlying tendencies for the stilling of all um, here's his formations uh, Sankara uh, for the relinquishing of all attachments for the destruction of craving for dispassion, for cessation, for Nibbana he thinks thus so I shall be annihilated so I shall perish so I shall be no more. Then he sorrows, grieves and laments. He weeps, beating his breast and becomes distraught. That is how there is agitation about what is non-existent internally. Venerable Sir, can there be no agitation about what is non-existent internally? There can be, Monk, the Blessed One said. Here, Monk, someone does not have the view, this is self, this is mine, uh, this I am and all that. Uh, I shall endure as long as eternity. He hears the Tathagata or a disciple of the Tathagata teaching the Dhamma for the elimination of all standpoints, decisions, obsessions, adherences and underlying tendencies, for the stilling of all formations, for the relinquishing of all attachments, for the destruction of craving, for dispassion, for cessation, for Nibbana. He does not think thus, so I shall be annihilated, so I shall perish, so I shall be no more. Then he does not sorrow, grieve and lament. He does not weep, beating his breast and become distraught. That is how there is no agitation about what is non-existent internally. i stop here for a moment. So here externally uh, refers to things of the world, for example, property. Uh, so somebody, if he loses his property, uh, uh, then he says, alas, I had it, alas, I have it no longer. Uh, so he gets agitated. Uh, uh, and uh, if he's not attached to it, then he's not agitated. La. That internally refers to the self. Uh, if a person uh, does not understand the Dhamma, then he comes to listen to the Dhamma. And then he hears the Buddha says, uh, there is no self. Uh, then he becomes confused. Uh, he thinks, uh, formerly I had a self, now I have, I have no self. Then he has lost his self. Uh, so he becomes agitated. La. But if a person understands the Dhamma, then when the Buddha says there is no self, he does not become agitated. Mm.
monks, you may well acquire that possession that is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and that might endure as long as eternity. But do you see any such possession, monks? No, Venerable Sir. Good monks, I too do not see any possession that is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and that might endure as long as eternity. Monks, you may well cling to that doctrine of self that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who clings to it. But do you see any such doctrine of self, monks? No, Venerable Sir. Good monks, I too do not see any doctrine of self that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who clings to it. Monks, you may well take as a support that view that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who takes it as a support. But do you see any such support of views, monks? No, Venerable Sir. Good monks, I too do not see any support of views that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who takes it as a support. Monks, there being a self, would there be what belongs to myself? Yes, Venerable Sir. Or there being what belongs to a self, would there be myself? Yes, Venerable Sir. Monks, since a self and what belongs to a self are not apprehended as true and established, then this standpoint for views, namely, this is self, this the world. After death I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. Would it not be an utterly and completely foolish teaching? What else could it be, Venerable Sir? It would be an utterly and completely foolish teaching. Stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is saying that if there was something, some possession that is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, then you should acquire it. But the Buddha asked the monk, Do you, can you find any such possession? And they said no, because everything in the world is impermanent. It cannot be uh, unchanging, uh, eternal. Um, also the Buddha says, uh, um, if there is a doctrine of self, uh, uh, of the ego, uh, that would not cause sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair, uh, then you can cling to it. Uh, but is there any such doctrine of self uh, that would not cause suffering? And the monk said, no. So the Buddha said, I also cannot find any such doctrine of self uh, that would not bring us suffering. And then Buddha says, um, if there is a, a view uh, uh, that would not arouse uh, suffering, uh, sorrow, lamentation, etc., then you can take it as a support. But there is no such uh, view. Uh, if you held on to it, uh, that would not give you suffering. Uh. So the Buddha says uh, that uh, since there is no self, uh, any teaching uh, that talks about the self uh, is utterly and completely foolish teaching. Monks, what do you think? Is material form or body permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent, suffering and subject to change, fit to re be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Venerable Sir. Monks, what do you think? Is feeling, perception, volition, consciousness permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent, suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent, suffering and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Venerable Sir. Therefore, Monks, any kind of material form, whatever, any kind of feeling, perception, volition, consciousness, whether past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all of these aggregates, uh, these five aggregates, uh, should be seen as they actually are with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Uh, Seeing thus, monks, a well-taught noble disciple becomes disenchanted with body, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. This, uh, <clears throat> being disenchanted, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha says that the five aggregates which we take to be the self or as belonging to the self 
or in the self, uh, or the self in the five aggregates. Uh, uh, these five aggregates uh, uh, basically is body and mind, uh, and also you will consider as five things: uh, this body, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. Uh. So, because it is impermanent and suffering, uh, it is not fit uh, to regard it as I and mine. Uh, because if you regard it as I and mine, uh, when it changes, uh, then you will suffer. Uh. So seeing, seeing it in this way, a uh, uh, noble disciple becomes wearied or disenchanted. And then after that, he becomes dispassionate and that will bring him to liberation. Monks, this monk is called one whose shaft has been lifted, whose trench has been filled in, whose pillar has been uprooted, one who has no bar, a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, who is unfettered. And how is the monk one whose shaft has been lifted? Here the monk has abandoned ignorance, has cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump, done away with it so that it is no longer subject to future arising. That is how the monk is one whose shaft has been lifted. And how is the monk one whose trench has been filled? <clears throat> Here the monk has abandoned the round of birds that brings renewed being, has cut it off at the root so that it is no longer subject to future arising. That is how the monk is one whose trench has been filled in. And how is the monk one whose pillar has been uprooted? Here the monk has abandoned craving, has cut it off at the root, so that it is no longer subject to future arising. That is how the monk is one whose pillar has been uprooted. And how is the monk one who has no bar? Here the monk has abandoned the five lower fetters, has cut them off at the root, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. That is how the monk is one who has no bar. And how is the monk a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, who is unfettered? Here the monk has abandoned the conceit I am, has cut it off at the root, so that it is no longer subject to future arising. That is how the monk is a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, who is unfettered. Monks, when the gods with Indra, with Brahma and with Pajapati seek a monk who is thus liberated in mind. They do not find anything of which they could say. The consciousness of one thus gone is supported by this. Why is that? One thus gone, I say, is untraceable here and now. Uh, so here the Buddha is talking about the Arahan uh, is the uh, one whose shaft has been lifted, etc. Uh, the description has been given by the Buddha, so no need to expand on it. So saying monk, so proclaiming, I have been baseless, uh, baselessly, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misrepresented by some recluses and Brahmins thus. The recluse Gautama is one who leads astray. He teaches the annihilation, the destruction, the extermination of an existing being. As I am not, as I do not proclaim, so have I been baselessly, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misrepresented by some recluses and Brahmins thus. The recluse Gautama is one who leads astray. He teaches the annihilation, the destruction, the extermination of an existing being. Monks, both formally and now, what I teach is suffering and the cessation of suffering. If others abuse, revile, scold and harass the Tathagata for that, the Tathagata on that account feels no annoyance, bitterness or dejection of the heart. And if others honour, respect, revere and venerate the Tathagata for that, the Tathagata on that account feels no delight, joy or elation of the heart. If others honour, respect, revere and venerate the Tathagata for that, the Tathagata on that account thinks thus, they, for, they perform such services as these for the sake of what had earlier come to be fully understood. Therefore, monks, if others abuse, revile, scold and harass you, on that account you should not entertain any annoyance, bitterness or dejection of the heart. And if others honour, respect, revere and venerate you, on that account you should not entertain any delight, joy or elation of the heart. If others honour, respect, revere and venerate you, on that account you should think thus, 
they perform such services as these for the sake of what had earlier had earlier come to be fully understood. Now stop here for a moment. Huh? So here the Buddha says huh, that the some recluses and Brahmins huh, have been baselessly, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misrepresenting the Buddha. That the Buddha teaches the annihilation of a being. Huh? What the Buddha is saying, uh, because the Buddha is teaching uh, that there is no being. Uh, so other external ascetics, uh, they teach that there is a being, there is a self. Uh, so when the Buddha says there is no self, uh, so they accuse him uh, of destroying this, this self. Uh, but the Buddha's teaching uh, is that basically to start with, uh, there is no, no self. Uh, it's just an illusion, a delusion. Mm. Just like... Uh, you see the uh, simile of this uh, neon lights. Last time, uh, uh, nowadays, uh, it's not so, it's not so common. Uh, these neon lights, uh, you have a lot of lights, uh, and the lights uh, light up and stop. Another one will light and stop. Another will light and stop. Uh. So you, it seems as though the light is going in a, going in a in a certain direction, right? Because one will light up and stop. Another will light and stop. So there is, you see, uh, like a. Uh, a line of, of light going on continuously. But actually, there's no line of light, it's just an illusion. So in the same way, our consciousness, uh, we think, is an unending stream of consciousness, but our consciousness is not an unending stream. Our consciousness arises and passes away extremely fast. Buddha says there's nothing faster than the mind. So our consciousness arises and passes away, arises and passes away. It arises actually because of sankara. Uh, if you look at dependent origination, uh, avijja, pachaya, sankara, sankara, pachaya, vinyana. Uh, avijja is ignorance. Because of ignorance, uh, there is sankara. Sankara is the will to live. La. And because of the will to live, uh, our consciousness arises. La. But it arises and passes away. And because of the will to live, uh, again it arises and passes away. And because of the will to live, uh, it arises and passes away. So each time it arises, uh, we are alive. But the moment it, it, it ceases, uh, we are dead. So we again, uh, because of our consciousness, uh, the will, uh, we make the consciousness arise again. But we cannot sustain it, it will, it will die again. So we are trying to exist uh, moment to moment. Uh, we are using our will, uh, trying to live. Uh, actually, you cannot live. The moment you exist, uh, you will die. The moment you exist, you will die. So, uh, we are making an extreme effort uh, to exist, uh, but actually we don't exist here. Yeah. We seem to exist, uh, just like the, the line of lights. Uh, the line of lights is going, going, going. You think it is going, uh, but there is no, no line of lights going. It's just an illusion. Uh. So similarly, uh, uh, that's why uh, in the suttas, uh, the Buddha says uh, there is no living being. Uh, so... Other uh, external sect ascetics, they don't understand. Uh, so the Buddha, they say the Buddha is teaching the annihilation of a being. <coughs> Therefore, uh, lastly, the Buddha says, uh, if others revile us, uh, then we should not be annoyed. Uh, and if they honor and, 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 and uh, respect us, so, uh, we should not be delighted. Uh. Yeah, we just uh, take it uh, that they have understood the Dhamma, so they uh, provide such services. Uh. Therefore, monks, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. What is it that is not yours? Material form or body is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Similarly, feeling, perception, volition and consciousness is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Monks, what do you think? If people carried off the grass, sticks, branches and leaves in this jeta grove, or burned them, or did what they liked with them, would you think people are carrying us off or burning us, or doing what they like with us. No, Venerable Sir, why not? Because that is neither ourself nor what belongs to ourself. So too, monks, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. What is it that is not yours? The body is not yours. 
feeling, perception, volition, consciousness is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, it will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. I'll stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha says uh, that these five aggregates, uh, body, feeling, perception, and volition, and, and body, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, uh, which is basically, basically uh, body and mind, uh, which we take to be the self. Uh, the Buddha says it's not the self. Uh, um, because in some other suttas, the Buddha says uh, we have no control over these five aggregates. Uh, uh, they, uh, they come and they go. Uh, so if we cling to it, uh, because these five aggregates are impermanent, uh, if we cling to these five aggregates, uh, then when they change, uh, they, they will give us suffering. Uh, mm. But we tend to identify uh, with these five aggregates. Uh, uh, that's why we have the identity view, uh, Sakaya and Ditti, uh, which is eliminated by an Arya. Uh, <clears throat> Monks, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me, the, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork. In the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork, there is no future round for manifestation in the case of those monks who are arahants, with taints destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached the true goal, destroyed the factors of being and are completely liberated through final knowledge. Monks, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, free of patchwork. In the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, etc., free of patchwork, those monks who have abandoned the five lower fetters are all due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. Monks, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, etc., free of patchwork. In the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, etc., those monks who have abandoned the three lower fetters and attenuated lust, hatred, and delusion are all once returners, returning once to this world to make an end of suffering. Uh, similarly, those monks who have abandoned three fetters are all stream enterers who are no longer subject to perdition, bound for deliverance, and hated and headed for enlightenment. Similarly, those monks who are Dhamma followers or faith followers are all headed for enlightenment. Uh, similarly, those monks who have sufficient faith in me, sufficient love for me, are all headed for heaven. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Mm. That's the end of the sutta. So this final part, uh, the Buddha says uh, that uh, he's talking about those uh, monks uh, uh, who have attained uh, the various Aryan stages, uh, the, the, the ones who have attained Arahanhood, uh, the fourth fruit, uh, uh, there is no more uh, uh, rebirth for them. Uh, and those who have attained, who have destroyed the five lower factors, uh, uh, the Anagamins, uh, they will take rebirth in the pure abodes uh, without returning from that world. That's why they're called Anagamins, uh, non-returners. Uh, and those who have abandoned three, the three lower factors uh, and attenuated, uh, uh, weakened, uh, lust, hatred, and delusion, uh, uh, once returners, uh, Saka the Garmins, uh, they come back to this human birth one more time uh, to make an end of suffering at the Nibbana. Uh, and those who have abandoned three factors, uh, all street enterers, uh, Sotapanna, uh, headed for enlightenment, uh, maximum seven, seven more lifetimes. Uh, and then those who, have, who are Dhamma followers and faith followers uh, are all first path attainers, uh, also headed for enlightenment. Uh. Even the monks uh, who have faith in the Buddha, uh, love for the Buddha, they are all headed for heaven, uh, the Buddha says. Uh. So this sutta is quite long, only 15 minutes. Uh. <clears throat> so there are so many things in this sutta, uh, started with the with the Buddha saying that this, this silly monk uh, has a wrong view uh, and uh, saying that sensual pleasures uh, are not obstructions. But the Buddha says definitely uh, uh, you cannot engage in sensual pleasures uh, without sensual desires. Uh, and then uh, the Buddha says uh, uh, when we learn the Dhamma, we should grasp it uh, correctly, uh, just like grasping a snake. Uh, you grasp the snake wrongly, uh, you get bitten. Uh, uh, so in the same way, uh, in the Dhamma, when we learn the Dhamma, we have, learn, have to learn it for the right purpose. Uh, the right purpose is to understand the Dhamma. 
uh, when we understand the Dhamma, then it will help us to cross over to the other shore, la, just like the raft. La. Uh, so the, the, the Dhamma is like the raft, uh, bringing us to the other shore. La. Then later the Buddha talks about not to be um, attached to the f- five aggregates, la, uh, and not to attach to views, la, uh, because they give us suffering. La. Uh, so, then also the Buddha says, uh, if others praise us or revile us, uh, we should not be moved. La. Uh. Sutta number 23, Vamika Sutta, the end hill. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Nata Pindika's Spa. Now on that occasion, the Venerable Kumara Kasapa was living in the blind man's grove. Then when the night was well advanced, a certain deity of beautiful appearance who illuminated the whole of the blind man's grove approached the Venerable Kumara Kasapa and stood at one side. So standing, the deity said to him, Mang, Mang, this ant hill fumes by night and flames by day. Thus spoke the Brahmana, delve with the knife, thou, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a bar. A bar, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmana, throw out the bar, delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a toad. A toad, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmana, throw out the toad, delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a fork, a fork, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmana, throw out the fork, delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a sieve, a sieve, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmana, throw out the sieve, delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a tortoise. A tortoise, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmana, throw out the tortoise. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw an axe and a block. An axe and block, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmana, throw out the axe and block. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a piece of meat. A piece of meat, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmana, throw out the piece of meat, and delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a Naga serpent. A Naga serpent, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmana, leave the Naga serpent, do not harm the Naga serpent, honor the Naga serpent. Monk, you should go to the Blessed One and ask him about this riddle. As the Blessed One tells you, so should you remember it. Monk, other than the Tathagata, or a disciple of the Tathagata, or one who has learned it from them. I see no one in this world with its gods, Maras and Brahmas, in this generation with its recluses and Brahmins, its princes and its people, whose explanation of this riddle might satisfy the mind. That is what, that is what was said by the deity, who thereupon vanished at once. i stop here for a moment. So this monk <coughs> was living in the blind man's grove, uh, in the forest, uh, practicing. Uh, and at night, uh, 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 a deva came. Uh, he says deity, not sure whether it was a deva or a devi. Uh, and was very bright. Uh, and he spoke this uh, riddle to this monk, uh, saying that uh, this, uh, this, this end hill uh, and fumes by night uh, and flames by day. Uh, and then this Brahmana, this holy man came and told this uh, wise man, he said, uh, use the knife, la. delve with the knife, la. go take the knife and, and search, la. poke out, see what you can find. La. And then the first thing he saw was a bar, la. this wise man saw a bar, and he said he saw a bar. And then the, Bra- the, the Brahmana, the, the holy one, la, told him, throw away the bar la, and continue delving again. La. And then he saw a toad, and then he asked him to throw away the toad and delve again, and he found a knife, etc. 
So this this uh, uh, deity said, uh, very few people will be able to answer this uh, riddle. Then when the night was over, the venerable Kumara Kasapa went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and told the Blessed One what had occurred. Then he asked, Venerable Sir, what is the ant hill? What the fuming by night? What the flaming by day? Who is the Brahmana? Who is the wise one? What is the knife? What is the del delving? What the bar? What is the toad? What the fork? What the sieve? What the tortoise? What the axe and block? What the piece of meat? What the naga serpent? And the Buddha said, Monk, the ant hill is a symbol for this body, made of material form, consisting of the four great elements, procreated by a mother and father, built up out of boiled rice and porridge, and subject to impermanence, to being worn and rubbed away, to dissolution and disintegration. What one thinks and ponders by night, based upon one's actions during the day, is fuming by night. The actions one undertakes during the day, by body, speech and mind, after thinking and pondering by night, is the flaming by day. The Brahmana is a symbol for the Tathagata, Arhan, Samasam Buddha. The wise one is a symbol for a monk in higher training. The knife is a symbol for noble wisdom. The delving is a symbol for the arousing of energy. The bar is a symbol for ignorance. Throw out the bar, abandon ignorance. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. The toad is a symbol for the despair due to anger. Throw out the toad, abandon despair due to anger. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. I'll stop here for a moment. The bar is a symbol for ignorance huh? because the bar is a big obstruction. Uh, so, uh, so the, the uh, Brahmana is the Buddha. Buddha says, uh, throw out ignorance uh, because it's a big obstruction. And then the toad uh, is a symbol for despair due to anger. Toad is an ugly thing. Uh. So when we are angry, uh, we are also ugly. Uh. That's why the toad is a symbol for despair due to anger. Uh. Mm. The fork is a symbol for doubt. Throw out the fork. Abandon doubt. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. That is the meaning. The sieve is a symbol for the five hindrances, namely the hindrance of sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and remorse, and doubt. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So the fog is a symbol for doubt. You know, in the fog. There are so many. Uh, how do you say? So many ends. Uh. You don't know which one to choose. Lah. You have a. Uh, uh, doubt, nah? and the sieve. Nah? The sieve is uh, uh, symbolizes uh, a fine obstruction. The bar just now was a big obstruction. The sieve uh, is is a finer obstruction because uh, the sieve uh, uh, tends to obstruct the the, the um, some things uh, from passing through. Lah. So, uh, so. Uh, that's why it's a symbol for the five hindrances. Uh, the five hindrances are the five obstructions. Uh, uh. The tortoise is a symbol for the five aggregates of attachment, lame, namely the body, uh, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness aggregates. Uh, uh. So why is the tortoise a symbol for the five aggregates? Because the tortoise uh, uh, has got the... Uh, um, when it's walking, uh, four limbs come out uh, plus the head, uh, right? Uh, so there are five things. Uh, uh. Mm. The axe and block is a symbol for the five chords of sensual pleasure. Uh, forms, um, sounds, odors, flavors, tangibles uh, uh, that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable. Mm. Connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Mm. Now, according to the commentary, the X symbolizes sensual desire and the block symbolizes sense objects. So if you say the X is sensual desire, the block is sense objects, huh? so the, the X huh, will chop the, the block. But sensual desire chopping sense objects does not seem so logical. 
maybe it's the other way around. It's, uh, X is the sense objects, uh, because the sense objects uh, uh, impinge on us. Uh, the forms impinge on our, on our eye. You can see chop our eye. Uh, sounds chop our ears. Old, uh, smells or odors uh, chop our nose, etc. Uh, so the block maybe is the sense basis. Uh, our uh, eye, our ear, nose, tongue, body and mind. Uh, because the uh, sense objects are always chopping our sense basis. Uh, the piece of meat is a symbol for delight and lust. Mm. The Naga serpent is a symbol for the monk who has destroyed the stains or asavas. Uh, that is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Kumara Kasapa was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Mm-hmm. And that's the end of the Sutta. So here, uh, so here this riddle uh, uh, can be said uh, to be a monk. Uh, uh, because this uh, wise one uh, is a symbol for a monk in higher training. Uh. So a monk in higher training uh, is working hard. Uh, uh, is working hard uh, to get rid of all these uh, things uh, that are uh, blocking him. Uh, starting with uh, ignorance uh, and then uh, despair due to anger, doubt, uh, five hindrances, etc. So the Buddha is advising him uh, to continue working. Uh, so here the working is to, to delve with the knife, uh, keep digging up, keep digging up all the, all the rubbish. Uh, so eventually uh, uh, he gets down to the Naga serpent, uh, the enlightened being. Uh, so he becomes enlightened. Uh, so this just uh, this uh, deity, uh, this Deva or Devi, uh, uh, just testing the monk, see whether the monk understands this riddle or not. So we stop here. What is your question again? Um, you see, the Buddha said this, uh, how many that uh, so he described uh, one star has been lifted, uh, the other one is Chang has been filled in. Killer has been upset to describe each and every one. And uh, all this, all, all this except the one who has no bar, which is um, uh, 30, 34, which uh, says that the Buddha says that has, here the man has abandoned the five lower factors. Mm-hmm. So if the monk has abandoned the, only the five lower factors, then he's an anagami. But here, the rest of the, the, the description are for arahans. They are untested. If they are again, if they are untested, that means they destroyed all the ten factors. Mm-hmm. So I'm just curious with you. Because here at the bottom, it says that monk, when the god and uh, with Indra, etc., it says the consciousness of one this god is supported by this why is that uh, it's untraceable is it? so I wonder whether it includes the one who has no bar is it? Anagamin actually Anagamin uh, has uh, practically finished his work uh, he's just waiting to enter Nibbana so uh, even when he and Adagamina uh, is reborn in the pure abodes, uh, even if he does not do any work, uh, he will still enter Nibbana. Uh. So maybe uh, it includes the Anagamin. Uh. Yeah, but see, that means uh, they, they, like Mara uh, is always searching to trace whenever the uh, uh, man who is practicing uh, passes, passes away, he will try to trace his consciousness. That means that Anagamin he cannot trace also. Uh. Uh, but uh, you see, uh, Anagamin uh, is reborn in the, such a high heaven. Uh, uh, it's beyond the Mara's reach. Uh, he cannot go there. Uh. I just want to check with you something. It's like uh, the monks at uh, Rav, they are actually 
uh, towards the direction, it means that they want to go to Nibana. So it's like house and around river. So uh, probably uh, this is like a craving, like you yeah, are like going out of river. So probably we, sh we shall be cool, like not to so much craving of our oh, river or Nibana to practice this spiritual path. Mm -hmm. Is that? Um, this uh, there is one sutta where the Buddha says uh, that uh, generally uh, sensual pleasures uh, uh, brings along with it uh, uh, craving uh, attachment uh, uh, but the Buddha says uh, not all sensual pleasures uh, come along with uh, craving uh, because uh, uh, when you attain jhana, uh, it is also a kind of sensual pleasure, but uh, it does not. Uh, uh, no, no, the Buddha says uh, all, not all pleasures uh, uh, brings along craving. Uh, the normal sensual pleasures uh, brings along uh, 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 comes with uh, craving, but uh, the bliss of jhana, the pleasure of jhana, does not have craving. And on the reverse, uh, the Buddha says, uh, 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 grief, uh, grief uh, generally uh, brings with it, uh, grief or suffering uh, brings with it aversion. Uh, when you have pain or anything, uh, you have aversion for it. Uh. But the Buddha says not all grief uh, uh, comes along with aversion. So the Buddha mentions, uh, like somebody who desires liberation, uh, so he's pining for liberation, grieving for liberation, uh, but that does not bring along aversion. Uh, so, uh, so when we desire uh, this uh, liberation, uh, also you must not be too agitated. If you desire it too strongly, uh, uh, then uh, it's like the Buddha in his early days uh, when the Buddha was striving for enlightenment. Uh, the desire to become enlightened was so great uh, that he went to great lengths uh, to practice these ascetic practices, uh, these uh, unbeneficial ascetic practices, uh, which gave him a lot of suffering, uh, but which brought no, no, benef no benefit. Uh, for example, starving himself, uh, eating only particular types of food, uh, even to the state, uh, uh, to the stage of uh, eating only uh, cow shit, uh, cow excrement, and even to the state stage uh, of eating his own excrement, the Buddha said, uh, and also like uh, uh, eating so little until he was eating one grain of rice a day, uh, so he nearly died from that. Uh, so that is uh, uh, having excessive desire. Uh, that's why in the first sutta of the Sangyutta Nikaya, the Buddha said uh, when he strove, that means he strove too hard, uh, he was whirled around. Uh, because when he strove too hard, uh, he was so agitated, uh, wanting to become enlightened, uh, that he was whirled about, uh, his mind was very agitated. Uh, and then when he stood still, uh, did nothing, uh, he sang. Uh. So the Buddha said, uh, uh, without striving and without standing still, uh, he crossed the flood. Uh. So you do your work, your work to become liberated, uh, but don't get agitated over it. Uh. The important thing uh, when we walk the spiritual path uh, is to be walking on the right path. Uh. And the right path, uh, you can only be guided by the Buddha's words. Uh. Uh, that's why the Buddha said, uh, after he is gone, uh, take the Dhamma and the Vinaya as his teachings. And the Buddha also said, uh, if any monk teaches such and such, uh, claims that such and such is the Buddha's teachings, the Buddha said, uh, don't accept and don't reject. Compare it with the suttas and the vinaya. If it accords with the suttas and the vinaya, that is the Buddha's teaching. Otherwise, it is not. So, so, the, so the most important thing is to practice the correct path, following the suttas and the vinaya. And whether the fruit comes or not, don't worry. The Buddha says. When a hen uh, is sitting on the eggs, la, I keep sitting. Uh, uh, it, uh, if he is doing this work uh, of sitting on the eggs all the time, uh, 
Then uh, he, the hen does not need to make a wish. Uh, oh, may my eggs hatch. Uh. The, Buddha, <laughs> the Buddha says, uh, the eggs will hatch naturally. Uh. But if he has not sat long enough on the eggs, uh, then the Buddha says, uh, the hen uh, may make a wish. Uh, oh, may my eggs hatch today or tomorrow, may my, the eggs hatch. Uh. He will not hatch. Why? Because he has not done enough work. Uh. The hen has not done enough work. Uh. So in the same way, uh, we don't count our eggs. Uh. <laughs> so we just do our work. Uh, and then uh, just uh, as long as doing your work, uh, the, 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 the result will come naturally. Uh. So the important thing is to walk the right path. Uh, the Buddha gave a simile uh, of somebody. Uh, he saw some people uh, getting oil uh, by pressing uh, sesame seeds. Uh. But probably he saw it from a distance. Uh, he was trying to, to steal their, their, their trade secret. Uh. So he saw uh, they were doing this to get oil. So he quietly he went. And what did he do? He got sand uh, and tried to crush the sand to get oil. Can he get, can he get oil? He cannot get Because he's doing the wrong thing. So in the same way, the Buddha says, uh, when you make effort, uh, make sure you are making effort in the right direction. Don't make it in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. As long as you are doing it in the right direction, when the result comes, uh, don't worry. If the result doesn't come, it means you haven't sat on the eggs long enough. Uh. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you want to take an uh, express, uh, then this, this lifetime become a monk. Uh. Uh, leave your wife uh, at home, uh, come and become a monk. We are here to say such things as the deep standpoint of view. Under the standpoint of view, if you uh, are okay, which, uh, which, uh, the same thing, uh, number 15. 15, uh, okay. So the five education should be considered uh, that this is not, uh, this I am not, this is not mine, mm -hmm. this I am not, this is not myself. Mm -hmm. So the last one, this is not myself, not myself, mm -hmm. this is the same as a non-self or no-self. Mm, some people say uh, it is not self. La. Mm. Sometimes they say no-self. Sometimes they say no-self. They say no In a way, la. in a way. There's no-self, meaning there's nothing la, that is permanent. La. If there's something that is permanent, unchanging, la, you can identify that with the self. La. But if, if something... La, uh, only exist for a sh for an extremely short time. Uh. For example, uh, just now I mentioned about our consciousness. Our consciousness arises. Uh. So when the consciousness arises, uh, you say you are alive. But the next moment, uh, the consciousness ceases. Uh, you are dead already. Uh. So when the consciousness arises again, uh, it's a different self already. Different consciousness. Uh. Huh? So the, this, the second consciousness arises. Uh, if you identify yourself with it again, uh, again you will cease. Uh, cease. And again another consciousness arises. That's a different self already. But all these uh, you say is, is me, is my, I. But it's not you. It's changing all the time. Uh, so uh, that's why the Buddha says no self. No. It's a wrong view to say there's a permanent self. Mm. And also, it's a wrong view to say that there is no self. And no, I didn't say it's wrong view to say there is no self. Mm. So, uh, the, uh, the five states mm. will be arising and ceasing away mm. the time. But you see, when sometimes the Buddha talks about the self uh, in the conventional self, in the conventional sense, uh, uh, when the Buddha says, uh, 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 I, I teach the Dhamma. Um, but there is no I, ma. Uh, the Buddha says, I teach them. In the, in the way of speaking, uh, worldly way of speaking, uh, there is a self. La. But when the Buddha says uh, no self, uh, he says anatta. Anatta means uh, no one thing uh, that is permanent, unchanging, uh, that you can identify yourself with. La. There's no such thing. Mm. So, but the arising and ceasing of this... Uh 
and fight every day. Mm. Is there a term to describe it? The terminology? I, I don't understand. Is there a term that in a sutta to describe you know, the arising and seizing or this and fight every day? Ah, the Buddha always talks in the suttas ah, about, ah, always says ah, that consciousness is dependently arisen. Because there is one sutta where a monk says ah, it is the same consciousness ah, that travels on the round of rebirths. Lah. It's the same consciousness. Ah. But the Buddha says that is wrong. The Buddha says ah, uh, consciousness, ah, every consciousness ah, is dependently arisen. Ah. Depend on what? For example, the seeing consciousness. Uh, for the seeing consciousness to arise, uh, there must be a good eye uh, and there must be a form coming before the eye. Lah. And then, uh, uh, when there is contact, uh, then uh, the consciousness arises, uh, the seeing consciousness arises. Lah. Uh, uh. So, similarly, for hearing consciousness, lah. Uh, it does not consciousness does not exist uh, automatically by itself. It must have condition for it to arise. Uh, that's why uh, the Buddha says uh, consciousness is not an ending stream of consciousness. That's why you notice in the dependent origination uh, the way the commentators and Abhidhamma uh, talk about vinyana. They talk about the the, the, the last consciousness as though consciousness is an unending stream and then when consciousness ceases uh, then only uh, they say the consciousness stops and then arises again but it's not like that every moment to moment uh, consciousness is arising and passing away rising and passing away uh-huh. one more normally the Chinese believe in this lady mm-hmm. is it the wrong view or is the thing itself no, it's not a wrong view. It's a wrong translation. Because in our uh, uh, English books, uh, uh, this uh, anatta, no self, uh, they translate it as no soul. So because they translate it as no soul, uh, they think uh, there is no lingun. Uh, they say uh, uh, there is also the uh, Abhidhamma teaching. Uh, the Abhidhamma teaching uh, is that when a being dies here, uh, and is reborn there. Nothing goes from here to there. And that is their understanding of anatta. Their understanding of anatta is that uh, when this be, when this con- when this being dies here, the consciousness ceases. Uh, nothing travels over to there. But there, the consciousness starts. Uh, that is not what the Buddha said. The Buddha says uh, that there is this uh, being uh, when he when he dies here and is reborn as a human being there, uh, this what the Buddha calls a Gandaba. Uh, sometimes it's called intermediate body. Uh, this intermediate body uh, will go and enter the womb there. Uh, so there is something uh, entering the womb. Uh, so it's because of their not understanding the nature of consciousness. Uh, so they cannot accept uh, that something goes and enters there. But the teaching of the, the, the Buddha is that anatta means uh, that there's nothing uh, permanent. Everything is changing, changing. So this linghun, uh, this soul, uh, is also a bundle of energy. Why cannot you accept uh, this bundle of energy uh, going and being reborn there? Because it's uh, just a bundle of energy on him. Uh, it's a uh, uh, like this being uh, entering the womb, uh, uh, according to those people who remember their past lives, uh, they were reborn as a small being. Uh, and this small being uh, entered the womb. Uh. So if you can accept this big being, uh, uh, this human body uh, is so big uh, compared to the small uh, being uh, that enters the womb. Uh. Uh, if this small being does not exist, uh, then this body also does not exist. Uh. How can you can accept this, this flesh body to be existing or a deva so huge uh, can exist? Uh? Why can't you accept a small being? This soul to, to exist. Another thing uh, is that the Buddha says uh, when a person's uh, karma is so bad, uh, 
Then when he dies, uh, he's due to be reborn in hell. Uh, then the hell beings will come up uh, and drag him down to hell. Now drag what? Drag his soul. Uh. He cannot really drag his body. His body is lying here dead. Uh. Uh, so the hell beings come up. Ngao Tao Ma Min. Gu Tao Be Bin. will come up and drag his soul down to hell. What is this soul? It's just a bundle of energy. Uh. Because uh, this bundle of energy uh, is all within consciousness. La. It's just a dream. Uh, name, uh. This being, uh, he, this uh, so-called being, uh, he dreams uh, that he's being pulled down to hell. It's just his dream. Uh, yeah. yeah. Bante, yeah, certain seeds, the teaching is an emptiness. What is the comparison to our non soul? Ah, it's the same thing. La. Emptiness means empty of a self. Empty of self. Mm, empty is the, the same. Empty of something that is permanent, na, unchanging. Yeah. Sunyata. Okay, thank you, Bante. Mm. Okay. Um, living for a long time is desire, I know, uh, many people. But because of family attachments and a lot of commitments, it seems like a bit selfish to just live. So what 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 do you think? Because uh, those who left for monkhood have brought a lot of suffering to their own people. So how to reconcile this? There are two types of suffering. There are two types of suffering. La. One is mental suffering. One is physical suffering. When a monk uh, goes forth uh, uh, and he leaves the family, uh, uh, he should uh, take care of their physical needs. Uh. For example, a man, uh, he has started a family. Uh, and he's got some young kids and all that. Uh. If he walks out of the house, uh, the wife has to look after the kids, right? So if he does that, uh, he has to make sure uh, that the family is financially well provided for. Uh. For example, like the Buddha. The Buddha, uh, when he renounced, uh, his son uh, was just born. Just born only. But he walked out of the house. Why? Because according to the suttas, the Buddha said uh, that his father was rich. Uh. Uh, that's why I built three mansions for him for the three seasons. Uh, so the family was very rich. So when he walked out of the house, uh, he didn't have to worry about money. Uh, they were well provided for. The wife and children was well provided for. Of course, he gave them mental suffering. Uh, but this mental suffering, to give them mental suffering, uh, is good actually. Why? Because uh, Dukkha is a very good teacher. After the Buddha left them, then he practiced and became enlightened. Uh, and then he came back, taught them the Dhamma, and helped them to become... You notice nowadays, because life is good, uh, a lot of uh, young people, uh, they grow up uh, without seeing Dukkha. So because they don't see Dukkha, they have a, a particular view of the world. But when they, go, when they grow up, uh, after they graduate and all this, and they go out into the world and work, uh, then they find uh, a lot of dukkha. Uh, in the house, uh, as a young man, uh, they had no pressure, uh, no stress. But after they start working, uh, they find so stressful, uh, and the world is so cruel uh, compared to their, to their, to their home. Uh, so many people out to cheat them, uh, and all that. Uh. So, the sooner they learn Dukkha, the better. Uh, some of the older people like you and me, uh, in our younger days, uh, we did not have such a good life. Huh? I remember when I was young, uh, there were times when the tap had no water. I had to walk out to the street and carry water. Uh, because it was not often. Uh. But because of that, uh, uh, also because the family was not rich, uh, we learned to be thrifty. Uh. We learn to save money and all these things, huh? so we become better for it. Huh? So also, in life, huh, people who learn the Dhamma, you see the people who learn the Dhamma at a young age and people who practice the Dhamma at an old age, huh? sometimes 
you know people there are some people uh, refuse to come and learn the Dhamma yeah, and ask them to come and listen to a Dhamma talk they refuse ask them to do charity they refuse they say I don't harm people why should I take the trouble to go and do charity uh, some people have this attitude so at the end of life uh, when they are about to die uh, then they see uh, oh, yeah, the ghost realm uh, ghost relatives coming to welcome them and then they panic and then they get scared uh, then they realize oh last time uh, uh, this Ong used to ask me to go and listen to Dhamma talk and never went to go <laughs> then they regret uh, so uh, that time they learn too late right uh, so in the same way sometimes a person like like myself when 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 I was young, uh, my parents didn't know Dhamma. So when I told my parents I wanted to renounce, uh, my father's eyes became red. Uh, so also I knew I was not, it was not ready, uh, so I waited, uh, waited until the time was ready. During that waiting period, my father passed away. And then finally, uh, I renounced. And then, of course, my mother felt a lot of dukkha. But after I renounced and I taught the Dhamma, and I taught her to listen to Dhamma and I saw she benefited from it so uh, it helped her a lot nah. so she had uh, more time uh, to listen to Dhamma so if for example uh, you think uh, if I renounce uh, I'm going to hurt my father yes you're going to hurt your father but that is good for him because hurting him now uh, is better uh, than when he dies, uh, then he realizes uh, the importance of the Dhamma. At that time, you cannot help him already. But now, like the Buddha, uh, when he left, uh, the family was so, so hurt. But when he came back and taught them the Dhamma, then they realized uh, all that pain was worth it. Uh. All the pain was worth it. Mm-hmm. Okay, you are very lucky you are a singer. But for, for us, men, people, we have a vow. We go to the registrar of marriage to be there to our funds. So that kind of bounds is used against us, I mean, against the spouse. So it, it is a, not an easy thing to get out of there. If a man gives this type of excuse, uh, it means his time is not ready yet. <laughs> uh, when he's ready, yeah. Uh, you see, like the, 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 the Buddha's time, uh, many arahans were married, you know. Uh, like Mahakasapa, uh, he had a wife, and others also, so many. Uh, uh, some of them even had four wives and very rich family and all that. Uh, uh, Anuruddha, Badia, Badia was the chief of the Sakyans. And, no vows. Huh? No vows. Hey, God, who said no? Unwritten only, ma? Unwritten only. Yeah, I think. I share my mother's uh, honest behavior because uh, when I want to come here for three months, so he said, and my wife said, uh, What do you intend to do? So I said, At the end of three months, I can No, I may become one. And uh, then she said, Then she said, You are abandoning me. Mm. So sometimes it's, very, it's a very, very uh, difficult thing to, to do. Is there any easier way of handling <laughs> this? <laughs> easier way of handling this? <laughs> At time is not ready yet. <laughs> okay, we stop here, lah. Getting late, now. Mm. Ah.